Hey, good morning. Good morning, Grove, and good morning, new people. I am uh, Charlie, the lead pastor here at the Grove, and really, really glad that you are worshiping with us. Um, especially if you're new, we really are glad that however you found us, through a friend or just uh, somebody sharing or whatever, man, we are really glad that you are here, and we would love to connect with you any way that we can. Uh, Mark mentioned that at the beginning. He'll talk about it a little bit later. We would love for you to go to uh, Grove Church dot org slash connect and we would just love to help you get connected um, with with other believers during this time let you a little bit know more about our church it's a very strange very odd time but we still want to do everything that we can to help people uh, stay connected and go ahead and get connected with the church uh, we don't have to have be meeting together on Sunday to be connected to stay connected and would love for you all to be a part and so as we're kind of, you know, here it is on Easter, and um, you know, I don't know how much, you know, you guys know, I mean, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're streaming this, probably have some familiarity with church and how churches work, and you know, it's a little bit like, uh, the Easter's kind of like the Super Bowl in a lot of ways for, for pastors and for churches. It's when a number one or number two big, biggest calendar events, I mean, Easter and Christmas, those are kind of the big, the big times to get together, and um and, and here it is, you know, we, we're not using the word canceled, but it's obviously very, very different. Not being able to have the service, not being able to see everybody, not to be able to be together physically. And I'm just going to be honest, man, on Monday, I got, I, I caught a huge case of the sads. Um, I was here, I was working up here by myself at the church and um, I walked into the auditorium and it was completely empty. And of course it's empty, it's, it's a Monday morning, Right. And, but, but I walk in and it's completely empty and it, and it just, it just kind of hit me. It just hit me that, um, man, it's, it's going to be empty again. It's going to be empty all week. It's going to be empty this Sunday. It's going to be empty on Easter and it's going to be empty for a while. And, and it just, on Monday, it just kind of, it just kind of all got to me. And um, how much I miss being with you guys, how much I've missed the opportunity to get to meet uh, a lot of you who are new and have been connecting with the Grove over the last few weeks, uh, I've been joking with some different people on uh, social media how much I miss seeing their, their little kids. On, on Friday, there was a Zoom call that Kanye, our Grove Kids leader, did with, uh, with some of the kids. And just every kid that popped into the frame, it just it made my heart happy and at the same time, a, a little bit sad. And... Um, I just confess that all throughout the week, I've just kind of been a little bit uh, overwhelmed. And I'm not typically the kind of guy who um, looks at the, the things on Facebook or whatever that are meant to be inspirational and get inspired. Sometimes I just kind of, it just feels a little cheesy to me sometimes. But there was one I saw that was talking about Easter and it really impacted me. And it was just talking about what that first Easter weekend was like for the apostles. And just thinking about how they were all isolated, how they were all scared, how they were uncertain about the future. And, and, and what Saturday, Easter Saturday must have been like for them. And how in the midst of, of all of that, all of their fear, their, their, their sadness and fear about what happened to Jesus the night before when he was executed right before their eyes and their fear about what might happen to them and about how this might happen to us if they find us and they're all huddled up together afraid of what the future might hold. And then suddenly there is a knock on the door and some of the ladies who were following Jesus tell this incredible story. They went to go see Jesus at his tomb and he wasn't there. And an angel told them that he's not there anymore. He's alive. And suddenly in the midst of isolation and fear, hope explodes. And we're in 1 Thessalonians, we're in chapter 5 today, and um, some of you have been around with us as we've been doing this for several weeks now. For some of you, this is going to be your first time here, but they have been experiencing, these, these people, the Thessalonians, they've been experiencing their own heartache and fear and confusion. They've been experiencing a lot of persecution as a church, and Paul is trying to explain to them and encourage them and, and help get them to hang in there. And at the same time, some of the people 
that have been a part of this brand new church that Paul started there. Some of them are starting to, some of them have passed away over the last few months. And they're starting to get nervous and scared about what happens to somebody when they die. And so because of this persecution and, 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 the, and the fear of what happens to somebody when they die, they, they've got a lot of anxiety and fear. And Paul has been ministering to them uh, through this in this letter and has some in, inspiring words for them that I think incredibly apply to us and then also speak very passionately about what we're celebrating this week on Easter. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 And we're going to start in verse 6. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And so what Paul's talking about there, he's kind of referencing something he's said a few verses before. He's talking about people who are kind of um, living life like everything's fine. People who are just acting like everything in the world is great. Everything everywhere you go is great. Everything's great. The world is great. Nothing bad's ever going to happen. Just kind of people who have a very naive view about the way that the world works. And, and, what he, and what he describes there is, is like that people who have that sort of mindset are going to be completely overwhelmed as the world starts to decay. And so what Paul says there in verse 6, so let's not be like them. Um, they're asleep. And Paul's going to use the word asleep in a couple of different ways. If he wants to refer to people who are dead. But here he's talking about people who just aren't getting it, aren't getting what's going on. Let's not be like them. They're asleep, but instead wake up. Let's wake up. Be sober. Be clear in your head. Because sleeping people, they're, they're sleep, they, they sleep at night. When you're drunk, you get drunk at night. But you've got to be awake because of, the, of, of this day. And you need to belong. See, you belong to the day. You belong to God. You belong to Jesus. So in your mind, in your heart, in your life, you need to be clear. And, and I think the best way to say this is to be on your guard. Man, be aware, be awake, eyes wide open, looking at this world. You come into this world knowing that the way that this world works. Now, there have been times you preach an Easter message and you're telling people that they need to be on guard, you need to be on the lookout, you need to be sober about the way the world works, and you have to work really, really hard to convince people, hey, you know what? Sometimes this world is broken. Sometimes this world is scary. And you got to be on guard on that. And you got to be aware. If there's anything you don't need to say, we can just almost just kind of brush past this. Hey, guess what? The world's a scary place sometimes. Yes. I think we're all awake now. I think we're all sober now. I, I would think it's like 1030, right? It's like not 1055, 1055. We're all sober now. Metaphorically too, right? Metaphorically we're all sober now, right? We are all clearly awake on what this world is like. And for a lot of us, it probably did catch us off guard. Probably a lot of us were walking around and living and acting like everything's fine. This is all good. Everything's fine. This world is great. I'm secure. Every, my, my, I've got everything that I need. I've got all this protection. I've got insurance. I've got a great job. My spouse has got a great job. Everything's good. This is great. This world is just what I want it to be. And some of us were completely and totally caught off guard by that. Where our optimism really wasn't optimism, but it was a misplaced hope and trust in a world that is broken. Now, what I'm not encouraging, what I'm not saying is this is not a time for pessimists to celebrate. It's for pessimists to say, yeah, you're right. I finally, everybody finally figured out what I already knew. Everything's terrible. It's always going to be terrible. Everything everywhere is going to always disappoint you. You know, and, you know, I'm not t- encouraging pessimism. And I'm not encouraging a realism that is just masked pessimism. What I want us to have is an attitude that is very clear. That we understand that if I'm going to place my hope in something, 
it can't be this world. There has to be a space between everything is terrible and everything is always going to disappoint you and this world will never disappoint me. Somewhere between this, and again, using Paul's imagery, is someone who is awake, someone who is sober, and someone who is clear-minded. And says, you know what? I understand that I cannot place my hope in this world anymore. I understand that all of the things that I enjoy here in this world, they, they are tentative and they are temporary. And many of the things that a lot of us have placed our hope and our security in, um, the, the, the ground underneath us has begun to shake. And we've recognized that so much of what matters to us, so much that we, that, that we trust in is, is broken and gone. And so, I want what, what we need, the space between pessimism and, 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 and optimism about the way the world works, is that we need to make sure that we know, I know where my hope is. You have permission to be sad, but we do not have permission to despair. Mark talked about this last week. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4. We grieve, but we do not grieve like people who do not have hope. We grieve like people who have hope, who's, who, who we may be sad, but we are not hopeless. And then Paul explains this as he, as he continues on in verse 9 of chapter 5. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So again, asleep here, he's talking about whether you're a, a, a alive or dead. But really, he's, he really is talking about everybody. Even if you are dead, even if you're alive, but even in the other sense of awake and asleep, even if you, if you are clear-minded right now, or even if you're not clear-minded right now, you need to know that this truth is true for you. It's true for everyone who believes. And it is a very clear statement. It is the thing that we are celebrating here on Easter weekend. You need to be on your guard you need to know where your hope is, and your hope is found in this very simple phrase, Jesus died for you. I'm going to read this passage again. Part of me just feels like I just want to read it like 10 times and just sit down. Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. You are not appointed. You are not designed to live a life of misery. You are not designed. You are not appointed to be destroyed. You are not designed. You're not appointed to be someone for whom death is the end of your story. That is not who you were meant to be. That is not who God has created you to be. But you were created to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You were meant to be saved from the worst that this world has now and the worst that this world offers in death and destruction. You are meant to be saved from that. And that is what Jesus Christ did for you. He died for you so that you could have life so that awake or asleep, scared, happy, encouraged, sad, angry, frustrated, confused, no matter how you are right now, you will live together with him if you believe. If you will put your faith in trust in this incredible, awesome thing that Jesus Christ did for you, you can have eternal life. And so then he says, we'll just go back to the, those first verses that we're looking at, verse eight. He says that you can put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And so what he's saying there is like in your most sensitive places, in the places that you are most vulnerable, in your head and in your heart, you can put on your helmet the hope of salvation. It will protect you your brain. It will protect who you are, the way that you think, the way that you live. And then the faith that you have 
And the love that you have for God and the love that he has for you is a breastplate to protect you. This world is throwing a lot of rocks at us. It is shooting arrows at us. It feels like that they're coming after us with swords. What can I protect myself with? When all the things that I have put so much hope and so much trust in, what do I do? I protect myself with the hope of this salvation as a helmet and the love and faith as a breastplate to protect me. When the weakness of all of the armor that we have put on to protect us from the worst parts of life, to protect us, to keep us happy, to keep us from being afraid, to keep us, to protect us from having to ever experience loss, when all of that armor is exposed, what do we have? Well, we have something greater than you can possibly imagine the hope of this salvation. Death is a consequence. Death is a consequence for our sin. It's what we, it, it, is, it is the just and fair consequence for what we've done. And God looked at that situation. He looked at the death. He looked at people who are destroying themselves in this life and in the next. People who are separated from him, isolated from him. He looked at that and it broke his heart. And he sent his son Jesus not just simply to be a good teacher, not just simply to tell us good things, which he did, not just simply to tell us about how awesome God is, which he did, and those are great things, but that's not, that's not all that he did. He came here to die for you. So if death is my punishment, I need to be saved. That's why the word saved is used so often in the Bible. It uses it here, or at least a version of it, salvation. I need to be saved. I'm going to die. Death is going to destroy me. Death is going to end me. I'm going to be separated from God now and, and I'm going to be separated from God forever. But you can be saved from that. And that's what Jesus did. I understand that death is a consequence. It is a punishment for sin. And Jesus says, I will take that consequence. I will take that punishment. I will die for you so that death is not the end for you and so you can put your faith and trust in him so that you can know this that he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep we may live together with him and it's one thing to say it's one thing to say, oh, you know, Jesus died on the cross so that you can have eternal life with God it's one thing to say that but if he had died as someone who's saying he can conquer death. If he died and stayed dead, we'd all be sitting around wondering, is like, but did he though? Did Jesus really conquer death with his death on the cross? But you can know this to be true. You can know that Jesus has conquered death. You can know that death is not the end of your story because it was not the end of his story. He came back to life that day after, after a couple of days of fear and anxiety and uncertainty for his followers. He came back to life and demonstrated with power and authority that he is the one who can conquer death. He conquered death and showed us by coming back to life, by rising again. And that's what we celebrate on Easter. And that is the hope that we celebrate that's the hope that we celebrate, that this world, that's not the end for us. Death is not the end for us. Life with a God who loves us and life with him forever, that's the end. That is the hope that we have. And Paul finishes this passage in verse 11 with this. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Jesus died for you. Now tell the world. Tell the world. People need to know. People need this encouragement. They need to know what God did for them. People in hopeless, scary situations need hope. They need love. 
They need to know that God is with them. One of the most encouraging things for me that happens over the course of a given week is I just, I'll just get texts. I'll just get texts from people. I'll get Marco Polo videos. I'll get Facebook messages from people just, just asking, how you doing? And I don't, I don't reply to all of them all the time. Sometimes I, 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 I'll get in the middle of something and I, and I don't. And I apologize for that, for those of you who do that. But the, they're very encouraging to me. It lets me know, man, there are people out there. There's, there's, there's friends and there's love out there. And, and we need that. We need that kind of hope. We need to know that things are going to be okay. And this is what we tell each other. Hey, we're, 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 we're going to get through this somehow. And then giving people that kind of hope is really important. I'm still here for you. I, I still love you. And we're going to be okay. This is a next level of hope. I do believe that we're going to get through this. I do believe that we're going to be able to be together again. I, 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 I do believe that there's going to come a day where things are going to start feel relatively normal again. But that's not the hope that we need. The hope that we need when the next abnormal thing comes and when life continues to demonstrate that things are just crazy. The hope that we need is that no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what happens in life, no matter what happens in death, no matter what happens after death, I have the hope and assurance and trust in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we will live together forever with Him. And so, man, I just encourage you to encourage each other with that. To not just celebrate Easter just right now, but to let that sink deeply in your heart and encourage your family, encourage your friends. Let people know about what Jesus Christ has done for you. And, 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 and let that hope spread. That's why we're having Easter service today. Because the hope that we have, we want you to have. We have a hope that is beyond this world. We have a hope that is beyond what we see, but a hope and a trust that Jesus Christ died for us and so forever we will live with him. Encourage one another and build each other up with this. And so let's celebrate it. Let's, let's celebrate with worship. Let's celebrate and just thank God for that. Let's ask God to give us opportunities to share that hope with people. After we worship, for, uh, we're going to worship for a few minutes and then we're going to take communion together, which is, which is a celebration and a commemoration of Jesus' sacrifice for us and, 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 and a symbol of the overwhelming hope that we have with Him. And so I just encourage you. I just pray that it, whatever... Oh, Whatever, wherever you were, wherever, how asleep you used to be, however awake you are right now, however much you have surrendered to any measure of sadness or despair. Let us celebrate together the incredible hope that we have through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I've been thinking about this all week. God, this is an Easter we will never forget. We'll always remember the Easter we were at home. The Easter where we felt like we couldn't go to church and we and we we sat in our living room. We sat in our kitchen, our dining room, with just our family. And God, the life and death and security and fear and hope, God, were just already just overwhelming our hearts and minds and our thoughts. And God, I pray that the peace that we can receive from you by putting on that helmet of the hope of salvation and that breastplate of faith and love, God, I pray that it would be real in this moment. 
And that God, for those who have never experienced it, God, that they would, we would take those things, that we would believe, that we would trust in your son Jesus and his death and resurrection, that it is for us. And God, I pray that that hope would be real. It would sink down deep into our hearts, deep into our minds. And God, that it would not fade away. But God, that it would be an eternal hope that we carry with us. And no matter what this world throws at us, that we would rest secure in our faith and our trust and our hope in you and your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.